Well, hello, and welcome to the Kaveh 2020 virtual community and our fourth webinar in a series of special speakers being made available to our Kaveh 2020 virtual community. I'm Jan Gustafson Correa, CEO for Kabe. And while I really wish we could have been together about a week ago in San Francisco for the Kabe 2020 conference, I hope today amidst the COVID-19 crisis that you are in a safe place, managing the circumstances and ready to join together with your Kabe familia today and over the next several weeks via the Kabe 2020 virtual community website and webinars. I'm so pleased now to introduce you to our co-host for today, Ruby Flores. Ruby is Kavi's Acting Director for Professional Learning. Ruby? Thank you, Jan. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, today's webinar is being presented by our longtime friend, coach, and guide, Dr. Jose Medina, and sponsored by the generous support of Velasquez Press, a platinum level sponsor of Kavi 2020. As we get ready for today's exciting session, I have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speaker's microphone will be active and the participants will all be on mute. There will be interactive times in today's presentation and we will use the chat box for you to enter your comments. If you would like to post a question during the presentation, please also use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen and the chat window will pop up where you will be able to type in your questions or comments. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version of the Kabe 2020 virtual community website so you can re-listen and share it with others. Sit back, relax, and get ready for 45 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. To get us started, Join me in welcoming Jonathan Reis of Velasquez Press, who will be introducing Dr. Jose Medina, who will be presenting today on sociocultural competence in the age of crisis remote learning. Jonathan? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to this space, and I want to thank Kabe for doing such a great job uh, at creating this platform. We're, we're really honored to be a part of it. Uh, during these tough times, you can always count on pillars, and Kabe is no doubt one of them. Um, <clears throat> I also want to thank all of you for making the time to be here with us and keeping such a positive attitude during these difficult times. Uh, everything is so uncertain, and we feel really good to have so many people uh, join us this, this afternoon. Our hearts go out to all of those who have lost loved ones or who know members of our educational community who have had to deal with sickness. Uh, my father, who passed away a few years back, <clears throat> you know, he used to tell me that Hardships are among the most powerful teachers, and they help remind us of what matters most. And uh, you know, among, among revealing our limitations, they can also help bring out our character and they challenge us to uh, be innovative and uh, improve ourselves. So I wanna challenge you today to see how you can take some of this information and go back and help our students and families. Um, today, we host a very special guest for me and for our company. Uh, he's championed the message of how to help English learners and how to help improve our work in dual language, uh, specifically with social cultural competence. I won't, I won't say much more because, you know, his work speaks for itself. And of course, we all get to listen in a little bit about his thoughts on mon his Monday morning message. So um, I want to obviously highlight his passion for helping our students with you and let you know that if you need more help or more guidance in helping this uh, be implemented at your own school districts, you're welcome to reach out to us. Uh, my email address is jruiz at academiclearningcompany.com. Uh, without further ado, I leave you in the hands of Dr. Jose Medina. Hello, everybody. Como están? Este, I'm going to begin to share my screen in the interim. I'll let you know that I'm super excited to be with you all. Este, no se apuren que les voy a estar echando bombazos porque llegamos a hablar de las realidades, eh? But I do want you to know that I'm so very proud of all of the work that you have been doing. And um, I'm just blessed to be a part of your community. Así es que gracias, gracias y más gracias. Les manda saludos mi mamá, mi papá. Ya saben que tengo mamitis y papitis. And so they are, of course, excited that I just mentioned their name, ¿verdad? Um, can you see, um, Ruby, my presentation on the, on the screen? Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation um, from the first slide. 
So today we're going to be talking about sociocultural competence in the age of crisis remote learning. And I want to really thank Kabe for the opportunity to um, allow me to share some thoughts because this is weird. Esto está fuera de onda, ¿verdad? Like what we're going through is something that I don't think any of us um, ever planned for or were prepared for, but we're doing it and we're making it happen for the students that really have been marginalized most in our school system. Porque la mera neta, I mean, our language learners, our emergent multilingual students really have gotten the short end of the stick for a long time. And dual language really offers us the possibility to remedy that and to really offer students educational access that really should have been there forever and ever. Así es que comenzamos, ¿verdad? First and foremost, I wanted to share my contact information. Um, I did want to let you know that um, our sponsor, Velázquez Press, um, is going to allow me to give away um, one of my books, um, actually three books. So I'm going to check the postings for FASE book. That's how my mom says Facebook, ¿verdad? So you better post and you better put uh, hashtag Tabe 2020 and you better hashtag Velasquez Press. No se hagan if you want to win a book. We're going to give away a book on Fase Book. We're going to give a, a book on el Twitter, ¿verdad? Así dice mi papá. Pusiste en el Twitter. Sí, dale, puse en el Twitter. And another one for Instagram, okay? Para que no digan que no se les dio nada, eh? Pongan atención. Start posting away, but if you take a picture of me, just do it from afar para verme así más bien, eh? Órale. Perfecto. Um, I've received so many messages on social media, also um, via email. I just wanted to remind you that um, duallanguageschools.org actually did something pretty amazing. Um, they allowed all of us in the field to um, really put things, all of these resources, into the dual language online learning page on Facebook. So if you haven't gone to Facebook and done a search for dual language online learning, please do so so that you could go ahead and have access to this plethora of information and resources, um, especially right now with distance learning so that you could have all of those things at your fingertips. Gracias a, a duallanguageschools.org for really doing that for us. But those of you that follow me on social media know that if we were in person, estuviera así con el micrófono, verdad, y bailando, because we need to get into it in the name of equity and social justice. And so what I'm going to do is um, just remind you of my full name, porque mi nombre completo es el Dr. José Luis Medina Hernández Franco López Jr. Díaz Cruz, but we're going to start by dancing. And I know that I can't see you, but my dead grandmother, Juanita, which many of you know about, she's watching from up above. Así es que les voy a poner un TikTok, y lo que quiero que hagan es quiero que bailen con todo el alma. And if you are staying without moving and without dancing, I don't know what kind of advocate you are, ¿verdad? Bombazo. Ahí les va. Latino dance check. Vale. Así alguien sexy. Más cumbia, como cumbia, ¿no? Jonathan, bailale, te estoy mirando, Jonathan. Ven, hasta Jonathan lo regañé porque él sí lo veo. Yo soy bien bravo, eh, soy bien bravo. So now that we've gotten the dancing out of the way, I did want to start with our propósito, nuestro propósito. And um, I'm actually going to ask my friend Ruby, my co-host for today, ¿verdad? I'm the Oprah, she's my Gail. Um, Gail, a.k.a. La Ruby, um, she's going to be taking a look at what you put in the notes in the chat. And so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to read this information on the PowerPoint slide, and I want you to jot down your thoughts because I want you to participate. So here we go. Teaching under COVID-19 guidelines is not normal. It is not distance learning. It is teaching and learning in crisis. What does that mean to you? When, when I read that to you, when you read it for yourself, go ahead and type in, así como que saben escribir en la computadora muy rápido, because Ruby is going to be reading some of your responses. Maybe the responses are the ones that we should give a book to, ¿verdad? No sé, a ver cómo me siento, a ver cómo me siento. Échenle. It is teaching and learning in crisis. Ruby, what are some of the responses that are coming up um, from our type A personality, compadres y compadres? So we have our participants sharing, it's stressful, uh, hashtag truth, right? Um, must have, this is a crisis, yes, we must be prepared. Uh, the pandemic is difficult, children feel uncertain. Um, it's nothing like what we've expected before. 
heart to nos duele el corazón. Nos duele el corazón. Gracias, Ruby. Yeah, so keep writing. Um, I'm actually going to ask David to send me a transcript of the chat box because um, I want to be sure to read that this evening after we're done. I want you to know that I feel for you because mi corazón también me duele. Like, this is um, completely something that, that I personally was not prepared for. And I, I really want to say to you, take care of yourself first because you need to feel comfortable in your needs um, in order to effectively meet the needs of your students. Um, one thing that I, I actually posted on social media that caused a little bit of controversy, so I'm going to say it again, is that most of us um, as educators are good people. But the bottom line is that a lot of the decisions that we have made as educational leaders, as campus leaders, as district leaders, as educational entity leaders, those decisions were made with a good heart, but also through the lens of privilege. Let me say that again. A lot of the decisions that we have made in response to COVID-19 as good people, myself included, were made through the lens of privilege. And so it really has amplified the fact that we have screwed up kids that don't have and that don't fit into that monolingual, monocultural, patriarchal system of education. It has amplified that even more. And so it has to hurt us just a little bit. Me voy a callar para que les duela poquito. Because right now, for those of us that are trying to give grades, that are trying to assess how kids are doing, what we're doing is that we're grading and assessing and looking at student performance and really family performance through the lens of privilege. And so keep that in mind as we continue with the rest of the presentation. Woo! Jan, no sé si los miras, pero ya están así como, hijo, le llegó bravo el chaparrito. I told you. I told you that we're going to have fun, but we're going to keep it real. So let's move on to the next slide. As we continue, and don't worry, I'm going to hook you up with some information that I think you're going to be able to turn right around. I want you to think, first of all, what in the world is sociocultural competence? Because if at this moment you're not clear on what sociocultural competence is, then really we're at a loss because the work that we should have been doing in terms of goal um, number three of dual language programming if that was really in place every day when we were face to face with our kids, then that would have given us a, a heads up. That would have given us a connection to some of the work that needs to be done today. And so if right now you personally don't know how to quickly define sociocultural competence, then that's a reflection piece for you. I'm going to give you some scaffolding, ¿verdad? Un poquito de andamiaje. Think about the anchor chart in your classroom. Um, the bridge anchor chart in both languages color-coded with the three goals of dual language that you co-created with your kids. And that when you got into a remote situation, you immediately had a smaller version for every remote session. So that as, review, as you reviewed content, language, and culture objectives, you also asked the kids, how are we supporting the three goals of dual language? No? No lo han hecho? Oof, mira Juanita, que onda, que onda, verdad? Some of you are like, what anchor chart? Exactamente. And then, even a more important question, how are you lesson planning through an equity and social justice lens right now, when really we're assessing through a lens of privilege, how are you planning for this equity and social justice in a crisis teaching and learning scenario? How is it that when you come up with the lessons that you're sharing with your students in distance learning fashion, do you anticipate and ensure that you are still targeting that third goal, that sociocultural competence goal? Because remember that if you don't focus on sociocultural competence as part of your dual language programming, then you really don't have a dual language program. You have a transitional bilingual plus, maybe, program, or you have a dual language sub program, but a dual language program without an overt focus on sociocultural competence and critical consciousness is like a house built on quicksand. I said it. Qué Para que duela, verdad? Porque tenemos que manejar ese trabajo hoy más que nunca, more now than ever. I just wanted to remind you of the guiding principles for dual language. Everything that I'm going to share in the next couple of minutes, of course, is aligned with the guiding principles. 
And again, you have on your uh, diapositiva, that's how you say um, PowerPoint slide, la diapositiva, ¿verdad? Some of you are like, de veras, for sure. El, el enlace en la diapositiva, the link on the PowerPoint slide, you can actually get your free download. As one of the co-authors, um, I can tell you that we did the work as a service to the field. And of course, this is what guides the work of GABE. It's what guides the work of dual language education of New Mexico, of NAVE, of the state bilingual um, and dual language organizations. Really, if you've not really dug into this resource, you need to. Porque, pues, ahorita tenemos más tiempo, ¿verdad? Andale. These are the three goals of dual language. I talked about the three goals of dual language. Remember that right now, your kids need to, more than ever, understand why they're engaging in biliteracy work. And so if you didn't create, co-create an anchor chart with the three goals of dual language while you were face-to-face, -face, then perhaps that's one of the lessons that we should plan um, that we're gonna deliver the next time that we have some time with some of our students um, via the computer screen and remind them or teach for the first time that the reason they're working towards bilingualism and biliteracy in a dual language program is because these are the three things that guide everything that we do, whether face-to-face -face or in remote fashion. I'm not gonna spend time on the three goals because you know that I have some Monday, Medina Monday messages on that for parents and English and Espanol. Some of you even were a little bit pushy and you said, we need a YouTube page so that we can access that readily. So I created the YouTube page and some of those videos have already been transferred there. I wanted to show you what some teachers have done in terms of the three goals of dual language. This was actually co-created with the kids. You'll notice in all of the examples that it is color-coded and that there is student input that actually happens. If you didn't do this when you were in the classroom, please take the time to really do with this with your kids um, when you have a chance with them the next time that you see them on the computer screen. And you can even take a picture. Um, I did send the handouts to my friends at Gabe, so they're going to go ahead and upload them. But if you take a picture, I won't sue you, ¿verdad? Porque somos comadres y compadres. This is a very important slide. This is your definition of sociocultural competence because some of you didn't even know it. No se hagan. Los viste, Ruby, que no sabían nada. Se hacen así como que supieron, pero no sabían. Sociocultural competence is the ability to see the similarities and differences in each other, pero ver las diferencias como oportunidades de conectar y no como obstáculos que se tienen que sobresalir. And so it isn't about not seeing black. It isn't about not seeing female or transgender or short or tall. It is about seeing those things, but it is about seeing them as a way to really interact in a positive fashion with those that we are here to serve. Because at the end of the day, that's what's different about dual language. What good is it if our kids are bilingual and biliterate, have grade level academic achievement in two program languages, if they are not good, kind people that are on an unending journey to work on their sociocultural competence. And I love the next, um, the little next bullets, Ruby, porque cuando voy a las escuelas, Ruby, me dicen, we work on sociocultural competence. Y luego les digo, really? Tell me what you do. Y sabe lo que me dicen, Ruby? Me dicen, we have Black History Month activities. We have a multicultural night. And I'm like, ah, qué padre. And what else? And they're like, no, well, that's it. And I was like, no manchen. That is like the superficial level of sociocultural competence. It is a great initial step, but that is not what is going to get our kids to be better off than we are. Because the truth is, is that we're a big, hot mess. Actually, I'm the biggest mess of all. You're welcome. But I'm working on my sociocultural competence every day. And so that's what kids need to understand. So it goes beyond these initial steps that many of us have confused with sociocultural competence. Okay, Ruby, I les voy a echar otro bombazo. So I'm gonna read this diapositiva and you're gonna go ahead and enter your thoughts into the chat box so that my co-host, La Señorita Ruby, AKA La Gail, is gonna read some out. So here's something that I got a lot of flack on social media about. For the longest time, we've referred to our kids as L's which is such a subtractive label. We refer to them as LEP students. We refer to them as English language learners. 
And what we really need to be doing is labeling them in an additive or culturally sustaining fashion, which is an emergent bilingual or an emergent multilingual. Slife and Scythe students, that label kind of me da aquí, verdad? Because what that's saying is that we see kids coming into a space that really was created to promote white monolingual monocultural ideals, that we see them at a deficit simply for not aligning with those kinds of thoughts. So here we go. Every child in the United States is now a student with interrupted formal education. Cada estudiante en los Estados Unidos ahora tiene educación formal de, de interrumpida. I think I got that right. I was translanguaging, trying to mobilize my linguistic features for my one linguistic repertoire. What do you think when I say every child in the United States is now a student with interrupted formal education? As teachers with kids, are you willing to put scythe and slife as a label on your child? Oh, go. Chequea, chequea, Ruby. Sí, tenemos comentarios. Uh, dice, dice, Sarah, dice Sarah, me encanta esto. Y dice, des, decimos también, all of a sudden my colleagues understand more about my English learners. Uh, yes, when we label, it always seems to be done in a way to lessen who that person is. Uh, we also have more comments. Um, agreed, privileged students may have more resources to escape being labeled. Uh, and also they don't have the, they don't always have the same opportunities. And it's important for us to reflect how we can help. Perfecto, gracias. Don't you think that Ruby is so fantastic? Mira, y eso que es nuestro primer show juntos, eh? pero así, Ruby, lista. So here's the deal. I think we should label our monolingual students, perhaps limited multilinguals, verdad? Because they're the ones that really are going to be at a disadvantage in a global economy and a global community. And of course, I'm just joshing, but some of you are already freaking out. But every single one of our students is now a side for a slide student. So what are we going to do to ensure that that gap between the students that have and the students that don't have doesn't get wider and bigger and deeper? What are you going to do in your lesson planning to ensure that you are tackling one of the four things in every single one of your lessons that is going to move the work of sociocultural competence forward. And you're like, ay, ya, Jose, ya. Just tell me the four things. I get pushy. I'm getting there. Ahí vamos, ahí vamos. I wanted to remind you of the C6 by Literacy Framework. As some of you know, because there are many school districts in California, as well as around the country and internationally, that have embraced the C6 by literacy framework as a tool to lesson plan through an equity and social justice lens. Um, I love the C6 by literacy framework because our team really conceptualized a way to lesson plan that is not prescriptive, but that aligns with the three goals of dual language and is lesson planning through an equity and social justice lens that already embeds the sociocultural competence piece, as well as all of the most recent research in terms of cross-linguistic connections and translanguaging. And so if you've not had a chance to really engage with this work, you need to be listening to my hashtag Medina Monday messages because I do two and a half minute bites every single Monday or invite somebody from my team or myself to come and really engage with you in this work because it really is important. Um, these are the six C's. You have access to this. I did want to share with you that it is so culturally sustaining in nature that it is actually now being used in monolingual settings. And so monolingual teachers around the world are lesson planning through an equity and social justice lens um, as a means to really create educational access. Today, I wanted to give you your one page cheat sheet. So even if you've never been in a professional development workshop with me, even if you've never seen me at Gabe or one of the other conferences around the country, you have this one page cheat sheet that can be your help. It could be your tool because when you're lesson planning, you know that this is not a checklist, but these are the six pieces, the identifiers that you should bring to your grade level PLC, even if we're meeting via Zoom, so that you can identify did we actually include some element of collaborate in our lesson plan for next week? 
did we actually include something in terms of global citizenship and service to others? So again, not a checklist, but things to consider as you and your grade level PLC are planning. Because the truth is, is that you look, I've been an administrator, I've been to many meetings. Y lo que a veces hacemos es que nos presentamos a la junta de planificación. We show up to the lesson planning meeting, the, the PLC, and we start sharing activities. And we think that that's lesson planning, but that's not lesson planning. That's sharing activities. And so if we're not actively engaging and co-creating content, language, and culture objectives that are going to move the, the work forward, then in essence, what we've done is we've become the oppressors. If we lesson plan through a monolingual, monocultural, patriarchal lens, then we, in essence, have become the oppressors. Uy, los viste, Ruby. Ándale, ayúdame que casi me matan. No los puedo ver, pero les veo los ojos así echándome, este, ¿cómo se dice? Así bullets, así con los ojos, ¿verdad? Así otra vez, translanguage, mobilizing my linguistic features de mi un repertorio lingüístico. Today, I wanted to give you something that you could work on. So we're going to focus on culture learning targets. And these are the four ways that you can ensure that every single one of your lessons is working or targeting sociocultural competence. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an example, and then Ruby is going to check that you type in the right answer. It's 25 points apiece, son cuatro preguntas. I know you didn't think you were going to have an assessment. You're welcome. I'm going to see if you've really been lesson planning through a sociocultural competence lens. ¿Están listos? Whether you're Catholic or not, una persinada, sí, ¿verdad? Orale. Vamos. I've given you the four ways. If you don't hear anything I say today, hear this. Every lesson that I lesson plan, if I'm truly working towards sociocultural competence, has to have one of these four pieces. One, it should amplify the voices of marginalized communities. That means that you're amplifying the voices of the LGBTQ plus community, different religions, different socioeconomic statuses. You're um, talking about gender and equity. You're talking about um, immigrant communities. And so it isn't just those things that make us comfortable. It is the things that scare the crap out of us that we still need to engage in through our lessons so that our kids, again, are less of a mess than we are. Way number two, connect to the child and or the real world. That I think we do pretty well in dual language and even in monolingual settings. Three, cross linguistic connections and translanguaging. It's time to put aside the full separation of languages. Like we separate the languages as one of the co-authors of the guiding principles, absolutely I promote a 50-50 means a 50-50, but we also need to plan for cross linguistic connections because if not, we're just uh, managing two monolingual programs. Some of you perhaps are in a two in a monolingual dual language program. That means that Spanish or French or Arabic or Mandarin is a monolingual uh, strand and then English is the other. And somehow we call that dual. We even say things like I'm the Spanish component. I don't know what component you are or I'm the English component, not a component. We're both dual language teachers, even in a partner, um, partner model. Both of us are dual language teachers. One of us just happens to facilitate in English, but has to make cross linguistic connections into Spanish. And one of us facilitates instruction in Spanish, but has to make cross linguistic connections into English. And then the fourth one, social and academic language as equals. Esta les va a caer mal, especial a los que, especialmente a los que dan instrucción en español, because some of you that facilitate instruction in Spanish, Y'all are a little bit haters when it comes to the Spanish that is used by some of our students. Some of you have said to your kids, no se dice carpeta, no se dice pos. You know what? Pos is just as beautiful as the word translanguaging itself because pos is what my mom says. And so our job is to sustain and expand a student's linguistic repertoire. Our job is not to get rid of the pos or the sub or the carpeta. Our job is to keep the carpeta and add tapete and alfombra. Some of you right now, I wish you were in front of me because I could see, I would be able to see your eyes and then I'd be like, comadre, te veo, 
te veo. Because a unos les acaba de caer el costal bien fuerte. And I love it. Are you ready, La Ruby, para el examen? Here we go. I'm going to give you a cultural objective, and you're going to tell me, is it A, amplify the voices of marginalized communities, B, connect to the child and her real world, C, cross-linguistic connections and translanguaging, or D, social and academic language as equals? Vamos, adelante. I can make connections between the cultural destructiveness that led to the Holocaust and present-day injustices targeting immigrant communities. A, B, C, or D. If you get it wrong, it's 25 points off because I'm greeting your privilege. Ahí vamos más o menos, doctor. Ahí vamos. A ver, ¿qué, qué están poniendo? Pues ¿Qué nos, están taipeando, Ruby? ¿Qué están taipeando? ¿Qué es un gorgeous word? Muchas as, algunas veces, algunas veces, pero la mayoría vemos muchas as. So the answer is A. Ah, muy bien, aplauso para ustedes. No se sientan así tan cómodos. Here comes number two. Let's see if you get number two. Remember, 25 points apiece, grading privilege. I can make connections between the story's theme and my own personal life experience. A, B, C, o D. That's the answer from before, eh? Don't think I'm giving you an answer. A, B, C, o D. ¿Qué están poniendo, Ruby? Pues creo que sí pusimos mucha atención. We see a lot of bees. Everybody is on target. Are you for real? They're actually paying attention through the computer screen. Es que ya saben que Juanita es bien brava, eh? Juanita los viene y los visita a medianoche. I'll show you a picture of her. Question number three. That was right. Connect to the child and or real world. The third one. I can use cognados for geometric shapes to make connections between the two languages. A, B, C, or D. Más dale que se la saquen bien, eh? Ruby, pues A, vemos, A, A, Oprah y Gail, vamos. Vemos muchas C's. Algunos piensan C, tal vez D también. Tal Alguna, vez D. Sí. Uh -huh. Oh, I like the D. The answer is C, ¿verdad? Porque estamos haciendo conexiones lingüísticas and we're also um, leveraging the entire um, student's linguistic repertoire. But I like that you're thinking about social and academic language as equals. Me gusta. And then the last one, of course, you already know that I followed a pattern. So I can compare and contrast various on the market diet programs and present the information to two distinct audiences using appropriate language for each. So that one obviously is academic and social D. I did have one teacher in a face-to-face -face training say, Jose, but what does that look like for kinder? And I said, it looks like real easily. It looks real easy. You tell the kids as you're teaching in remote fashion, um, go ahead and explain how you solve this math problem, two plus two, to your parents in the language that they use. And then I want you to act like your parents is, are your principal. And I want you to then explain it a second time, but this time explain it to the principal. And maybe we'll add a third time. This time I want you to explain it to a Supreme Court justice. How did you solve the problem? And by simply changing the target audience, it changes um, the academic vocabulary, the language, the social language that the students are going to be able to use. I know that our time is coming um, to an end quickly, so I wanted to share some resources. For those of you that have not yet um, utilized lo que se dice se hace en inglés y en español in your classrooms, Remember that you can actually go to www.velasquezpress.com forward slash JM, that's Jose Medina, to purchase the books. This is something that is being used all over the country, including some large school districts in the state of California, as well as other parts of the country, to really work on the sociocultural competence piece. Why are you separately? Schools first sent you a link to DocuSign. Okay, thank you. I don't know who spoke, but thank you. Um, this, the reason they're, they're written in, um, they're, they're written separately, they're published separately, is because we really wanted to make sure that you were able to engage in some translanguaging activities. And so the students might read a poem in English and have to decipher, decide how did the poet then write it in Spanish or vice versa to make those connections. And then the other book is Familia. This one I love because I wrote with my sister, and so it comes with two perspectives. 
But today, I really wanted to amplify the voice of the LGBTQ plus community in dual language programs. And the reason that I wanted to do that, Ruby, is because last year I was in a school district and a dual language principal said in his evaluation of the PD, Dr. Medina is phenomenal. He's a great presenter. His research is amazing. The strategies are awesome, but he's a little bit too gay. Can you believe that, Rui? And that's a dual language principle that is supposed to be guiding the work of sociocultural competence. Luckily, um, the school district, of course, had conversations with that leader and invited me um, to come for multiple years after that, verdad? Así es que the, the training continues. But today I wanted to read a poem from my upcoming book. It'll be released later this year at La Cosecha. Boys don't cry, los niños no lloran. You didn't know you were getting some teatro, but you are. Así es que, I know you can't, I can't see you, but at the end, from your house, when I finish this short poem, van a aplaudir bien fuerte. Like, you're going to go like, ¿verdad? Porque estoy bien nervioso. Ahí va. Boys don't cry. I'm five years old. Mi papá wants me to be athletic and strong. He wants me to be un hombrecito. So he takes me to a park to teach me about baseball. We will practice catching the ball. I feel like jumping rope, but I can see that this is important to him. The baseball glove feels heavy in my left hand. Con ganas, mijo! My father screams as he throws the baseball my way. I give my full attention as I attempt to catch the ball, but the ball goes over my head again and again and again. I don't catch any of them. In his eyes, I see his disappointment. He wants me to be like him. He wants me to be excited about sports, to scream with he and my feels when they watch football on Sundays. And I just begin to cry. I cry because in my heart, I know that I will never be the kind of son that he dreamed of. I cry because I hate that I would rather be playing with a jump rope. Jose Luis, my father, he sees the tears in my eyes. Los niños no lloran, mijo. He tells me. Un aplauso, un aplauso que hasta les eché un poquito de lágrimas así, ¿verdad? Así, así bien fuerte. Hijo, este, este poema me llega al corazón. I want you to know that my dad has grown so much. Um, he, of course, now loves my husband, Tony, more than he loves me, ¿verdad? Um, but as a child, it was very difficult. And so I'm excited to write this book that is aligned with third through fifth grade um, Common Core and TEKS and SOL standards because the prior two books are also aligned with those standards and are being used all over in, in any grade level they can be used. And so that's the work of sociocultural competence. Um, I wanted to share four quick examples and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. So the first way that you can ensure that your lesson plan is focused on sociocultural competence was um, amplifying the voices of marginalized communities. I love this example. It's a school district um, in California. No, this is a school district in Colorado where the teacher starts her lesson by simply placing an image on the screen. And the kids have to practice, sometimes orally, sometimes in writing, what it is that they feel, what they think in terms of this image. And for those of you that have been through C6 by literacy training, you see the icon. So the kids immediately know that they're actually going to be practicing their um, writing. Because remember that we have five language domains in a dual language classroom, listening, speaking, reading, writing, and metalinguistic awareness. And so the kids know that they're practicing writing. Here's the one for the second one, connecting to the student or to real world. This comes from El Paso Independent School District. And I wanted to go ahead and share this example. This is a middle school example. Uh, Miss Hunt had her kids actually write poetry 
in terms of who they are. By simply allowing kids to share who they are, um, we are ensuring that that sociocultural competence work is moving forward. This is the third one. So this is a cross-linguistic work. For those of you that asked for the YouTube videos, I actually posted a YouTube video um, called uh, La Limpia. It's from the second book of poetry, and it's my grandmother doing a limpia, a cleanse. And so why wouldn't you be able to share that short two minute video with your students and actually have them respond in the opposite partner language so that the kids really are leveraging their entire linguistic repertoire and thus focusing on that cross linguistic work. I know that we have a couple of teachers that serve in monolingual classrooms. Remember that you can do that with any student that's an emergent multilingual, even in a monolingual setting. And then finally, um, for the fourth one, if you don't have a regionalism anchor chart in your classroom, whether you're um, setting up a classroom in your remote distance learning, regionalisms are really important. If a student says mucho, instead of telling him no se dice mucho, you could say, oh, tú dices mucho, puedes decir mucho dependiendo del contexto, pero vamos a añadir mucho para que dependiendo puedas movilizar esa parte del idioma basado en el contexto. If a student says sup, instead of saying, you don't say sup, you say how do you do, you would say, oh, you say sup, that's awesome. Depending on the context, you might be able to use that, so keep that. We'll also add how do you do, so that depending on the context, you're able to mobilize the pieces, the linguistic features that you need to communicate effectively, so regionalismos. And then um, I know that most of you um, have connected with me either via social media or I've been in your districts. Just my website in case you want me or my team to come and provide support. Um, we are actually doing all of the training online um, in remote fashion right now. So it's been very interesting, but we're having a lot of fun. Y señorita Ruby, sé que tenemos algunas preguntas y no mucho tiempo. Unas dos o tres para que no se enojen. Sí, claro. Muchísimas gracias, Dr. Medina. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, we have a question from uh, David. So, are so social and academic languages equal in different environments, in the same environments? How do you determine what's appropriate for what for a certain situation? Sure. So, um, I, the first thing that I would say is make sure that you have read the Translanguaging Classroom by Dr. Ophelia Garcia and Dr. Susana Ibarra Johnson. There's another co-author that I'm forgetting at the moment. I've been lucky to um, really clarify a lot of the questions that I had in terms of translanguaging. Um, so remember that we have one linguistic repertoire and within that one linguistic repertoire, there's no hierarchy. So I have social Spanish, I have academic Spanish, I have social English, I have social, uh, uh, academic and social English. I have a little bit of French, and so our job with kids is to teach them that we're going to sustain everything in their linguistic repertoire. And then we're going to add to that one linguistic repertoire. And so then they have all of those pieces available to them based on the context meaning that there's no hierarchy. Academic language is no better than social language because if, if after this um, webinar, I call my mom because I will, I call my parents every night, I'm going to be mobilizing social Spanish because if I show up to that phone call or that FaceTime and I say, mother, I finished a webinar and it was awesome. I was able to share all of the most recent investigation in terms, my mom is gonna be like, ya callate wey. And so what I need to do is I need to mobilize the pieces that are appropriate for that conversation and that context. Ama, a que no sabe que me fue muy bien, se presentaron muchas personas. Si les estoy echando ahí bombazos, ama, no de veras. Therefore, that is equal to my ability to converse academically as well. Ooh, me gustó mucho esa. Otra, Ruby, otra para ponerle el punto. Sí, una más para terminar. Eh, tenemos varios participantes, Richard, and we also have Delia asking, uh, what can we do to prepare for next year? What, what should we be focusing on right now so we can prepare and be ready for kids when they come back next year? Absolutely. So a couple of things. I actually created a short two and a two minute and 30 second video on the four things to keep in mind as we continue um, in this COVID-19 structure. But first of all, be kind to yourself. That's tip number one. 
stay the course in terms of your language allocation plan. I've been getting a lot of questions from principals, assistant principals and directors about should we, now that COVID-19 has happened, change the program model so that kids have more of a language. No, you don't go back to school and change the program model without actually um, having stakeholder input. And so we stay the course. If you are 90-10, you're 90-10 when you go back, you're a 50-50. So keep that in mind. Tip number three, make things real. Connect things to students because that's what's important right now. It's what's going to be able to allow them to be successful when we return to face-to-face -face instruction. And then the fourth tip, Focus on cross-linguistic connections. Like kids will get the English. English is such a language of privilege. I mean, it's suffocating most of the time. And so our job, if all else fails, focus on the partner language, stress the Spanish, stress the French, and focus on cross-linguistic connections. Thank you so much, Dr. Medina. We're so grateful for your encouraging, motivating, and crucial presentation today. This has really been a powerful addition to our CABIT 2020 virtual community webinar series. Uh, please, our participants, remember that the recorded session and the handouts will be posted on the CABIT 2020 virtual community website following today's presentation. Uh, I'm excited to share that on, two, on Thursday, April 23rd at 2 p.m., we will be welcoming Dr. Leti Ramirez for our fifth webinar. And on Tuesday, April 28th at 2 p.m., We'll be welcoming Dr. Alma Florada and Dr. Isabel Campoy, all sponsored by Velasquez Press, a CABET 2020 Platinum sponsor as part of our CABET 2020 virtual community webinar series. Again, thank you to, to Dr. Medina, thank you to Velasquez Press, and thank you all for uh, participating and for joining the CABET 2020 virtual community. On behalf of the CABET Board of Directors, the whole CABET team, we hope you have felt the CABET connection, inspiration, and love, just as if we were together physically at the CABET 2020 conference. Please stay safe, be well, and know that we're all on this together. We're CABET strong. Thank you and hasta la próxima. Adios, adios, everybody.